Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the epoxidation of alkenes. But before we get into that, let's go through the problems that I say in last lecture. In the first problem, I ask you to show why acetone won't react with Jones reagent. And initially what we have to do is we have to hydrate acetone the same way that we did with an aldehyde in last lecture. Once we have this hydrated ketone, we can attack chromium. And unfortunately, because this is an alkyl group and there's no hydride available, the chromium double bond oxygen is unable to attack the alkyl group. So while a hydrated acetone, or sorry, while a hydrated aldehyde is able to react, once we have a ketone, it cannot react. And so this is why acetone's able to be used as the solvent for the Jones re reaction, or the Jones oxidation rather. So in the next practice problem, we have an aldehyde, uh, as well as two different types of alcohols, and we treat it with some oxidizing agent, but we only want to oxidize the aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. And so which oxidizing agent should we use? And so if we use sodium chloride, which is the pinnic reaction, we'll be able to selectively transform the aldehyde without touching any of the remaining alcohol groups. And the reason for this is Jones reagent would re re react at the secondary and the primary alcohol, as well as the aldehyde, converting this to a carboxylic acid, a ketone, and another carboxylic acid, respectively. Now, if we think about it, if we used something like DMP, we'd be able to selectively oxidize this alcohol or this alcohol to the aldehyde or ketone um, without this aldehyde reacting. But with a different set of conditions, with a pinnic oxidation, we can further oxidize the aldehyde without touching the alcohols at all. And so with these mild tools at our disposal, we can really selectively modify molecules exactly the way that we want to. And this is why it's important for organic chemists to, to develop new reactions that complement the existing ones in milder and milder fashions so that we can get selective transformations. So let's get into today's material, the epoxidation of alkenes. So an important consideration when you're wanting to epoxidize an alkene is whether it's an electron rich or an electron poor alkene. Most of the time, if you have an electron poor alkene, you'll want to use an oxidizing agent such as hydrogen peroxide or sodium hypochlorite. There's also chiral modifications that exist using Jacobson's catalyst, which is a manganese catalyst that can allow you to access certain enantiomers of a given epoxide. You can also use different conditions to selectively get cis or trans epoxides if both are possibly formed. If you have electron rich alkenes, they're typically well suited for oxidations with MCPBA. Now, there's other peracids that you can use, however, such as peracetic acid, performic acid, and methyl magnesium phthalate. And if you want to do a different type of oxidation, you could use DMDO which is derived from acetone. And while DMDO is a very convenient oxidant, it's typically hazardous to prepare and it can be very unstable. If you wanted to do some other different asymmetric options, Sharpless epoxidation and Xi epoxidations are additional methodologies to look into, but as this is an introductory course, we're not gonna go into those today. So the two different types of alkenes that you can have include electron rich alkenes. And so here we can see that this alkene is partially negative. And the reason for this is these carbons are donating a little bit of electron density from that carbon-carbon bond into the alkene. This is called hyperconjugation. It's not like formally positive, formally negative, the same way that we would show with something like a Michael acceptor. But in this case, we can think of it as like they're just helping it be a little bit more electron rich. And so the more substituted an alkene is, the more electron rich it tends to be. Now, in this other case, if we have an electron withdrawing group, this makes the alkene partially positive because the carbonyl, or whatever the electron withdrawing group is, is pulling electron density away from the double bond. And so, in under these two different sets of conditions, we would uh, use different reagents, these two different contexts, rather. So, in the first case, let's imagine if we had an electron deficient alkene and we wanted to epoxidize it. So, under basic conditions, hydrogen peroxide is easily deprotonated to perform the peroxide anion. Here you can see that peroxide has an N of 15.4. This is quite nucleophilic. However, if you use MCPBA, it's also possible to use this as a nucleophilic peroxide source. However, we typically don't use this for 1,4 additions because it can also do reactions such as um, Bayer-Villager oxidation, which is something we'll talk about in a future video. Additionally, if you use bleach, hypochlorite, it's also quite nucleophilic with an N of 14.5. So these would all be possible options for the oxidation of electron poor olefins. So usually if we uh, have the E parameters for Michael acceptors, we'd be able to predict whether or not a 1,4 addition would happen forming an epoxide. Now, if you're curious about what E and N parameters do together, I would encourage you to revisit lecture 19. 
So let's talk about the mechanism of the oxidation of electron poor alkenes. So I'm going to show this as a 1,4 addition. However, other electron poor olefins which don't have a formally conjugated system can still undergo oxidation reactions forming epoxides. But because this, in this case, it's very easy to see why it occurs, we're going to use a simpler model. So initially, we have this peroxide or hypochlorite anion that can attack at the beta position. This then forms an enolate. However, the enolate can collapse back down, and the electron density of the enolate is able to attack at oxygen, displacing the leaving group, whether that's chloride, uh, carboxylate, etc. Uh, this would just vary depending on which reagent you're using. And here we go. We have formed our epoxide product. Now, as this is an epoxide under very nucleophilic conditions, you might be opening up this epoxide if the nucleophiles are around too long, so you might not want to leave these reactions for too, too long. Now, some examples of the oxidation of electron-poor olefins include the treatment of carbone with hydrogen peroxide in basic methanol, where we form this epoxide in quantitative conversion. Another example was the use of sodium hypochlorite in ethanol and pyridine to selectively epoxidize this position of this Michael acceptor in the presence of this other alkene. Additional ketones and a protected alcohol were also tolerated in this steroid core. Now let's talk about the electron-rich uh, alkene oxidation mechanism. This reaction is known as the Prilizev reaction, where we have a paracid. The interesting thing about MCPBA and related paracids is the OH of the paracid is able to hydrogen bond to the carbonyl of the paracid. And so what this does is it makes it easier for this oxygen here to be more electrophilic. And so the electron double bond, uh, the CC double bond electron density is able to attack at this oxygen. This, C, this COO bond is able to attack back at the other carbon, which then forms the acid as the byproduct, as well as this epoxide. Here are the structures of the different um, paracids that you might consider using if you're trying to do the oxidation of an electron-rich olefin. Now, typically, this middle one here is not as common in a research context, but it's quite often seen in a, in a industry context. So some examples of this include the MCPBA-mediated epoxidation of this phosphonate, where you can see it was formed in very high conversion as well as the use of peracetic acid in 1,4-dioxane, which epoxidized this alkene of this Diels-Alder adduct. The Diels-Alder is a reaction we'll talk about in a future video. Another interesting choice is the use of DMDO. It's really great because your only byproduct is acetone. However, when you prepare this, it can be quite explosive because this is using other peroxides for its preparation. And if you look at this, this is a very low ratio of carbon to oxygen and it resembles uh, acetone peroxides, which are typically used as like suicide bomb bombs. And so those are not great things to have around people. And so you might want to be very careful if you're ever working with DMDO. And if you're consider using this, if you're considering using this on any scale that's like significant, such as like more than maybe a one or 0.1 millimole reaction scale, it would be good to run this past a supervisor or someone far more skilled than you before you try anything like this ever. They can be quite dangerous, and it's good to be careful when you're working with peroxides, especially this type. And so initially, the alkene is able to attack at this oxygen. The CO electron density is able to attack back. This forms acetone as the byproduct. And so some examples of DMDO-mediated epoxidation include the epoxidation of this glycal derivative, where you can see it was formed in 88% yield. Another example was the selective epoxidation of the electron-rich alkene on the left here in the presence of this electron-poor Michael acceptor from this patent. And so with that, I would like to assign two practice problems for this lecture. In this first problem, show conditions that would give you the epoxide on the left, whereas you should also propose conditions that would afford the epoxide on the right. And so the useful thing about this is using our knowledge about the different methods of epoxidation, we can convert this one compound into two different useful building blocks. So this is one of the reasons why we care about understanding the mechanism of these reactions, so that we can predict reaction outcome. In this next problem, we take this alkene and we treat it with MCPBA. Do you think it might react with this alcohol? Would it react with this alkene? Draw what forms, and hopefully this isn't too difficult for you. And with that, I hope that this has been a useful lecture on epoxidation reactions of electron-poor and electron-rich olefins. And I hope it's been useful. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you.